Mr Kinnock. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Last week, the Home Secretary told the House that our asylum system is broken. Yesterday, her minister, who is sitting before us today, again stated clearly, our asylum system is broken. We on these benches completely agree, Madam Deputy Speaker. But what those on the benches opposite seem to continually miss is the Conservative Party has been in power for 12 years. The problem is they never stand up and take responsibility. They always try to blame others, from the civil service, the courts, even the media, with it being revealed this week that the Home Secretary banned the Financial Times, the Guardian and the Mirror from the press delegation accompanying her to Rwanda. A truly Orwellian move. Cancel culture at its worst. But the truth, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that with every decision it makes and every ill-conceived scheme it puts in place, this Government makes fixing our broken asylum system ever harder. And the first of these failures is on the asylum waiting lists. Under this Home Secretary, the Home Office is processing 50 per cent fewer cases than five years ago. The result? 37,000 asylum seekers languishing in expensive hotels, costing the taxpayer an eye-watering £4.7 million a year. £4.7 million per day, Madam Deputy Speaker. Labour would invest to save by increasing the number of case workers and decision makers so that processing times and hotel bills are radically reduced. Order, order. Now, come on, let's have a bit of reasonable behaviour. I appreciate that it's late. But it's simply rude to shout to such an extent that we can't hear the honourable gentleman. It's not reasonable. There's nothing wrong with a bit of banter, but it shouldn't be at such a level that I can't hear the honourable gentleman. Mr. Kinnock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's in this context that we are supporting Lords Amendment 7F today which would give the 60,000 asylum seekers on waiting lists the right to work to be reviewed after two years, reducing the burden on the British taxpayer and boosting the Exchequer. Secondly, during his negotiations with the EU, the Prime Minister completely failed to replace the Dublin III regulation, which means that we can no longer return refugees to the country in the EU where they would have first sought asylum. Numbers have increased because this Conservative government lost control of our borders by losing our long-held power to send people back. I will give way. For giving way. He says that we should be getting to a stage, you know, the Dublin Three is about not returning people back to Europe. Does he not agree that those people, illegal economic migrants, leaving France should just be claiming asylum in France? Well, of course, but they aren't doing that. And the reality is that if you had a returns agreement in place, which this Prime Minister has completely failed to negotiate, we would then be, uh, that would be the deterrent effect that we all want to see. The deterrent effect of a returns agreement would be so much stronger than the threat of being offloaded to Rwanda, because it would mean that every small boat refugee would be returned, rather than just a tiny percentage, which is the most you can hope for from the Rwanda deal. I will give away. Oh, will he tell us how many of those asylum seekers who came from France were returned to France in the period before we fully left Brexit? I can tell him that it will be a hell of a lot more than what will be returned under the Rwanda scheme. The Honourable Gentleman knows that 23, it is forecast, it is forecast that 23,000 people will seek to make that dangerous journey. The Rwanda Street scheme will not, even, will not even scratch the surface. That is the reality. The only way to deal with this problem is through a proper removal agreement. Only the Labour Party can reset the UK's relationship with France and the EU, and from there strike a robust removal agreement that would truly act as a deterrent against the criminal people smugglers by breaking their business model. A Labour government would also engage with Europol and the French authorities to create effective cooperation in the pursuit and prosecution of the criminal gangs who are running the people smuggling and human trafficking, rather than the constant war of words with our European partners and allies, which is all you ever get from this headline-chasing government. Cheap headlines is all they care about, 
as everybody on these benches knows. Thirdly, absolutely none of the government's safe and legal routes seem to work. The Afghan citizen resettlement scheme isn't even off the ground. The Syria route has been ditched. The dub scheme for unaccompanied children has also been cancelled. And the Ukraine scheme today had a queue of three hours long in Portcullis House of MP staffers fighting for Ukrainians on behalf of their constituents because the visas simply are not getting processed. Somehow, the Home Secretary has managed to turn an inspiring tale of British generosity into a bureaucratic nightmare. Labour would make safe and legal routes work, which in turn would strike another blow against the people smugglers. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I have a great time, a lot of time for this Shadow Minister, but he's on a really sticky wicket here. Can he just answer this, well, perhaps two parts here. Is it the Labour Party's policy that we should not take any migrants to Rwanda? That's the first bit. And secondly, is he not then scared that by not doing that, it will encourage the evil people smugglers in their work? The Honourable Gentleman will know that the Home Secretary's top civil servant has said that the Rwanda scheme will not work as a deterrent and it delivers no value for money whatsoever for the British taxpayer. What matters is what works, and this scheme will not work. Fourthly, Madam Deputy Speaker. <coughs> the the Honourable Gentleman uh, explained to me last week that he did not uh, support the Rwanda scheme. He's just reiterated it again. I'm curious to learn what is Labour's plan uh, to deal with illegal immigration in the Channel? Well, the Honourable Gentleman has clearly not been paying attention. I set out Labour's plan last week. I have just told him about the returns agreement. I have just told him about giving more resources to case workers and decision makers. If he would care to listen to the rest of my speech, he may not need to make another one of these meaningless interventions. Fourthly, Madam Deputy Speaker, in terms of government failures I touched on earlier, this bill is emblematic of the Home Secretary's tendencies to make challenges around our asylum seeker system even harder to overcome. She claims that the Rwanda offloading plan is going to solve the challenges our immigration system faces. But the refugee minister, her refugee minister, dismissed the plan as impossible just a week before the announcement, saying that if it's happening in the Home Office, on the same corridor that I'm in, they haven't told me about it, I'm having difficulty enough getting them from Ukraine to our country, so there's no possibility of them sent, being sent to Rwanda. Up and down the country, the British people are, costing the, are counting the cost of this government. Four billion pounds of failed or overrunning defence contracts under Boris Johnson since 2019 alone. 16 billion pounds of Covid fraud. Seven pound a year increase on energy bills without any meaningful support whatsoever. And now British taxpayers are told that they have to foot the bill for this pie-in-the-sky Rwanda plan, which will cost at least three times the, the amount we currently spend on asylum seekers and possibly even ten times more. I will give way. Thank you for giving way. Um, does the honourable member agree with me? My honourable friend agree with me that the proposal to ship asylum seekers to Rwanda is not only extremely expensive, but almost certainly ineffective, but also inhumane. The evidence from Australia shows that offshore detention often has a massive impact on the mental health of already vulnerable people and can lead to self-harm and suicide with no adequate support services available. How can we, as a fair-minded and generous nation, stoop to this? Well, I thank my honourable friend for her intervention. She's absolutely right. As we know, the Australia scheme uh, ended up costing approximately £1 million per person. The Israel scheme that the Rwanda scheme is based on completely failed, with uh, just about every single person that was sent to Rwanda leaving the country within days, many of them trying to come back to the place that they'd been sent from. It is uh, an absolute farce. I will give way. I think it would be very useful for the House's benefit and for the country more generally if he could confirm whether an incoming Labour government, in the eventuality that there were to be one, would cancel the Rwanda plan. Well, Mike, uh, what, 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 what I would contend is, what I, no, I'm going to tell you, what I would contend is the Rwanda plan, the, the wheels are going to fall off the bus very soon, so that question won't need to be answered by us because it will completely fail. Rather than chasing headlines, 
the Minister should be doing the nitty-gritty work of negotiating a returns agreement, giving resources to, to case workers and sorting out safe and legal routes. It is not the razzle-dazzle of Daily Mail headlines, but it is actually about getting the job done. So I'll, uh, yesterday, in Home Office Orals, the Minister could not answer a single question I asked him about the cost of the Rwanda plan. I asked him these. How many refugees does he expect to send to Rwanda each year? The Prime Minister says tens of thousands. Is that correct? What will be the cost per single refugee going to Rwanda? What will the £120 million sweetener being paid to the, by the UK to Rwanda actually be spent on? How many asylum seekers can Rwanda's detention centres house at any given time? And finally, given that the top civil servant at the Home Office refused to sign off on the Rwanda plan, citing concerns over value for money, when will the Minister publish a full forecast of the costs? Madam Deputy Speaker, not only is... I will defer. ...lined his opposition to the Government's proposal, but can he confirm, in answer to the Minister's question, it would an incoming Labour Government just cancel a plan or would they go ahead with it? Yes, I think we've made it absolutely clear that this plan is going to fail as the top civil servant as the Home Office, so the question won't arise. We won't need to deal with it. The wheels will fall off the bus, and we certainly wouldn't be spending £120 million on a press release, Madam Deputy Speaker. But not only is the Rwanda offloading plan a grotesquely expensive gimmick that is unlikely to deter people smugglers in the long term, it is also deeply un-British. Yeah. Dumping this challenge on a developing country 4,000 miles away with a questionable record on human rights raises serious questions about whether this legislation complies with UN refugee, the UN Refugee Convention, which is why we are backing Lord's Amendment 5D today. Another deeply un-British part of this bill was the idea that the rubber dinghies could be pushed back out to sea. Yesterday, we witnessed the Home Secretary's latest screeching U-turn this time reversing a, most un a particularly unhinged part of the legislation. The Home Secretary's pushback policy was almost completely unworkable. She was told by the Border Force, told by the French, told by her Ministry of Defence and even her own lawyers. But as we learned from court documents published yesterday, she had actually had agreed pushbacks could not be applied to asylum seekers in the Channel. But she tried to keep that secret so that she could keep her bravado and tough talking. We hope that she will correct the record, Madam Deputy Speaker. I have already pointed out to the right to, on the right to work and refugee convention. Order, order. order. Let, just let the House just calm down for a moment. Um, I am quite sure that the honourable gentleman, who is an experienced and honourable uh, and efficient member of this House, will know that he should not be making a general speech at this stage. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, not yeah, the yeah. second reading. This is very, very narrow. We're only discussing the amendments that have just come back from the Lords. We're not talking about general issues, and I'm, I'm quite sure the honourable gentleman will intend to stick to the narrow matter before yeah. us. And so will everybody else. Yeah. 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 Mr Kinner. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for your wise counsel. I have already pointed to the Work and Refugee Convention amendments, but we also need to move on to differential treatment. Lords Amendment 6, D, E and F provide that a person can be Tier 1 refugee if they have travelled through countries briefly on their way to the UK, as somebody from Kabul or Kiev would have to, or if they have delayed presenting themselves to the authorities for a good reason. This amendment would also require compliance with the Ref Refugee Convention and states that family unity must be taken into account. The Government should get behind this amendment. What in it can there possibly be to disagree with? Madam Deputy Speaker, the channel crossings have been taken out of the Home Secretary's hands and handed to the Ministry of Defence and the Royal Navy. The Ukrainian refugee scheme has been handed over to the Housing Secretary. And this Sunday, the former Director General of Borders and Immigration called for a new Immigration Department to remove responsibility from the Home Office. With her department now effectively in special measures, will the Home Secretary not just for once do the right thing Accept these amendments today so we can begin to repair some of the damage that has been done by this deeply counterproductive piece of legislation. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm standing up.